on this episode of the Ranveer show my co-founder Harshil Karya and myself hosted our hero our idol the founder of Marico Harsh Mariwala sir the genius behind the brand called Parachute the genius behind the product of Parachute hair oil and so many other countless businesses that have done well as i mentioned along the course of this episode i feel like harsh sir is like a samurai warrior his mentality is extremely strong extremely by the book and he has a set set of rules in his own head which helped him kind of grow in life which helped him grow businesses in life this was a slightly experimental episode for me because i tried co-hosting it after the longest time and i enjoyed the vibe of co-hosting so enjoy this particular episode with harshil karya myself and harsh mariwala sir remember to follow the ranveer show on spotify we're a spotify exclusive now which means that every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world this is harsh mariwala who returns on the ranveer show once again enjoy <music> Welcome to a very special episode of the Ranveer Show. After the longest time, we're co-hosting it with Harshil Karya, and on the show today, we are actually hosting Harshil Karya and my idol, Sir Mr. Harsh Mariwala. <laughs> Sir, thank you so much for coming down to the space, uh, being ready to do this candid conversation with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. I, when I was asked by you that why don't you visit up my studio, I said ha- happily I will come there and I will see what you set up. because i have a lot of respect for you i have done one show with you earlier which has had very good viewership so i said why not and i that's why i'm here i'm happy to be here i'm i'm humbled i'm sure harshil so and congratulations on the book it's been a month or so now that you've been everybody's raving about the book so uh, how has the reception to that been yes harshil i i didn't expect the kind of reception i've got for the book it uh, the day it it uh, was launched it hit the best seller in the business on day section one. Wow. i think day 1 or day 2 and i have had many appearances in television channels podcasts uh, in press interviews i have got phenomenal feedback from the readers yeah so i'm very happy the way it's turned out my objective of writing the book was not to make any money i mean i'm going to lose money i can tell you a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> but it's the whole objective is to share my learnings to others because if i can make a difference to others through my own learnings to me i will get much more satisfaction so right before the conversation i was telling you about another book that i read recently called the way and the power it's about the samurai culture mm-hmm. and how they have this sort of detached warrior mentality mm-hmm. you know like where they will take their job seriously but also view it by taking a step back yeah. and when i began reading your book i saw a lot of parallels in the style of writing in the energy of the book because i feel any book kind of is an inlet into the person's mind yes. especially if it's based on someone's life you get to know the energy of the internal world of the person yeah, yeah. so uh, i'm sure that this is something you have figured out later in life sir because <laughs> to be able to build a brand like parachute to be able to build marico you must have needed some amount of aggression when you were younger <laughs> and i feel that aggression has turned into the samurai mentality later so yeah, my I... my question to you sir is about that transition phase ki what how did you go from being aggressive and going for it into this calm warrior kind of so when you grow old and you start becoming mature this way when you are young you are like a you want to win every time you don't want to lose also mm. but when you start winning every time and then you say what what the hell i mean this winning is beyond that we have to lead good lives you know we have to have a purpose in life you know so as you age you start becoming mature and then you have this kind of thinking that i think your transition transition should be towards this route mm. but as far as the book is concerned i would say that my wife played a very very important role my book was initially when it was written it was dry it was more business like and what happened in the pandemic was that uh, we were sitting at home every day she writes very well though she has never written a book uh, and she we said okay let's she started reading the book and as she went on reading the book she went on adding value to the book lots of anecdotes which i had not thought of she got it out of me a mm. uh, lot of stories uh, better language more emotional and i think a lot of that credit goes to her and the book is very very simple very easy to read you can read it just before you go to sleep 
and at the end of every chapter i have professor ram charan who is a management guru he has written something like 30 books and he sold more than 4 million copies he gives his insight in just half a page one page so there is the lot of take home value for all the readers because of the story format converting into a conceptual framework uh so so i have to actually brief you and harshil about something i observed after our last conversation right so it was under your house it was in the auditorium under yes. your house and uh, right after the conversation i saw you taking your grandson away for uh, a snack okay and it 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 yeah, kind hot of hot chocolate <laughs> yeah i i look up to you as my business idol and then I, i just observed you doing that like you know you were wearing shorts you were wearing this shirt you were taking your grandson really cute kid by the way <laughs> yes uh and i was like that is the goal that is that should be the goal you know this this amazing family life and at the same time you have this business legacy so you spoke about your wife being a part of the book so yes. harshil and me have a lot of conversations about love family we co-founders also we're trying to build a mammoth organization called level yes. but um so what's your opinion on this whole aspect of family and work life balance and your love life mm. in the journey of business in the yeah. journey of taking on competition the journey of going to war what's what's their role <laughs> so when you start when you're young like both of you are so young you know initially when you have that burning desire to succeed i want to succeed i want to grow faster i want to grow faster then to some extent you have to sacrifice a little bit of family you know and that's what my children tell me that uh, my son uh, tells me that the time you spend with his son and his daughter my grandchildren is much much more than what i spent with them <laughs> <laughs> because now i have the time and you know i have maybe the mindset also is to to enjoy them mm. so maybe at that time i i was a little bit more involved in my business and building that business so it it must have suffered my time spent with them though i used to take holidays every year with them but uh, because of that desire to build fast uh, then one has to sacrifice somewhere mm. um but i think my grandchildren are my biggest source of joy if you ask me because the kind of closeness i have with them spending time with them every day one hour or so it just gives me immense joy mm. so to me that's that's a very very important part of my life mm. and i truly enjoy them being with them and you know just learn from them that curiosity that child like curiosity which is kind of like in your whole career also i i mean you'd never stop because you know you open chapter after chapter it's like parachute then safola then there's a nihar story then you're acquiring brands and you're going to africa then you're listing in bangladesh and it's fantastic so like where does this energy and this curiosity in you come from ha ah, that's a difficult question to answer because you know i think there is something genetic in every person gifts the god given gift I think the key thing is many of us don't know what is our God-given gift, and we have to identify what is that God-given gift, you know. Mm. And one of my God-given gift is that okay, I have a burning desire to succeed. I have to succeed, and for making that happen, and especially on the background of the fact that I nobody has taught me anything in business, I have just completed my graduation. I have not even done post-graduation, so I have to learn the business on my own, so that. desire to succeed in life makes you go into all directions whether it's rural india or whether it's learning or whether it is uh, you just talking to, to people yeah you reading talking interacting with others because at the bottom of it is that burning desire to succeed and it's okay to fail you know if you fail also you will try again you learn from that failure and then you will try they say passion is important but passion has to be combined with determination and perseverance because every person has failures in life and sometimes you win you never lose but you always learn so you know these are like mentalities that i think every young entrepreneur needs to know and you said how you didn't have business guidance uh, yes. you know just after graduation you began business yeah i feel like in your generation and i'm talking about the 70s yeah this was sort of a trend even my own uh, nana ji he kind of took off his own business career in, the, in a parallel way finished engineering and then got into business directly and we see the 80s 90s and 2000s where people were all about higher education at least this is a very kind of generalized statement but this is what i have observed yes. talking about urban india yeah. and now in the 2010s and 20s we're seeing a resurgence of like entrepreneurship right out of college true true okay coming to college students of today they're called generation z gen z are you yeah. familiar with this yes sir? yes okay so gen z uh, basically what they were born in say 2003 2004 yeah. matlab they were born into the era of social media mm. the, the era of information the era of google searches correct 
so they grew up with this heavy amount of information in their heads yes. which has kind of molded them into very absorptive uh, kind of human beings now like they're ready to learn a lot yes. it's also given rise to a lot of like mental health issues mm-hmm. because you know you said uh, how when you were younger you had that aggression to win mm-hmm. you you had to go to rural india because you had to do something you know you had that much energy so in your era i think that was a positive kind of gift to have mm-hmm. nowadays often with the amount of information out there mm-hmm. it can turn into something dark and negative mm-hmm. so did you have ever have a phase with this uh, you know urge to succeed did it ever work against you because it's working against a lot of gen z today they're putting too much pressure on themselves as 18 year olds 19 year olds so have you gone through a phase like that where you realize i'm putting too much pressure on myself let's dial it back a bit no never because i think ultimately growth comes in out of proper shall i say i don't want to grow for the sake of growing and take some rash steps without being sure mm. so deliberative has always been my strategy so i deliberate a lot you know i just don't do something and you know put in some big investment or i go on deliberating whether it's a new product analyze analyze talk to people because every person is a blind spot and if i talk to you or if i talk to him you will give me some other uh, suggestion which i have not thought of mm. so it's very important that you discuss your business idea especially if you are starting a new business with other colleagues friends family to overcome your blind spots and also get some new insights which you may not have had mm. and i have always been very deliberative and i think that really helps you in terms of uh, and also another thing is you know you dream they say you have to dream big but you have to dream big with feet on the ground you can't just dream big people just go on talking some nonsensical figures without really having a road map of how they will reach there that does not work you have to have your feet on the ground is it can i achieve it do i have the resources to achieve it does it make get traction from the consumer do you have a right to win do you have something truly unique pioneering which will which will get you that business so i think you have to if you have follow that policy then you will not be in a, in your own dream world you know you can't be in a dream world i think one of the themes of the podcast lately and which i learned from him actually uh, he's 6 years my senior from school and now because we're building a business together you get to learn your co-founder's mind a lot yes. and i've seen how patient harshil is and that's you know I, again i know you're also into sport a bit sir so i mean i think business is a lot like sport for me it's team sports i'm a big football cricket oh, basketball yeah, yeah. person and uh, if you have experienced players on your team your learning becomes very accelerated so the accelerated learning for me from him has been patience just kind of consistently do your thing and only probably in the last one year since i've started working with him in my own separate individual business journey have i seen the effect of compounding so compounding and patience are two key factors that gen z needs to learn so but uh, again i want to ask you the question so everyone knows the power of compounding would you like to add any lesson from the world of compounding or would you like to say something you know almost yeah. ethereal ethereal that you've learned from the so concept of so i can talk about power of compounding in terms of growth for example sure let's take one theme otherwise it becomes too general you know sure. like you can say power of compounding in stock market also mm. you know but the let's talk of growth so for growth to happen you need to do multiple things one is to be in a category which is growing because the environment helps you so that automatically with growth number 2 you should have something unique either pioneering or something which is innovative on a perpetual basis so you have to go on innovating so that your market share increases and if you are a market leader your market size increases and then most importantly you need to have very good talent who are growth hungry so the growth mindset normally starts at the top mm. i want to grow but my challenge is how do i put the growth mindset all the way to the bottom at my sales reps level at my distributor sales rep level to me that's a big challenge which the the top management has to realize and how do you do that you know you have to ensure that you give the right signal if somebody comes out with an opportunity i'm not saying that we blindly follow but you have to encourage them if there is an opportunity in a localized marketplace where the distributor of your competitor is having problems the rep should on their own say okay let me capitalize on that mm. so you have to go on instilling that growth mindset down the line when it comes to pricing decisions when it comes to payback in terms of new product launches or new country launches you can't say i want to make profits within one year then people will be more profit centric mm. you have to say that growth is more important as long as we see visibility of profit over a period of time and growth has to be sustainable i don't want to have one year where the growth will be high second year will dip third year again so i don't want zigzag i want like that growth 
and also profits also has to be sustainable. You can't have profits where one year you make profits, next year you make a loss. Mm. So I think that's what goes into making a very strong business. And growth is very important because growth is something which is like an oxygen. Mm. You know, if I am growing, then I am, as a shareholder, I am doing well. I am earning more money. I am creating wealth. Employees are also getting more opportunities. They get more emoluments, associates, your society, your customer. Mm. So I think growth is very, very important, growth mindset. And for growth mindset and for compounding to occur, you need to have a very strong right to win through innovation, through pioneering moves. It could be, depending on the kind of business you are, it could be some patent you're getting, getting or service standards or some business model or IT or whatever else. And then most important thing is talent, you know. Mm. You need to have very good talent, you know. So talent, talent who are self-driven, you know. I like to have, when I recruit a person, I, do you have it within them? I don't want people to say, oh, guide me doing this, guide me. You have to, we will empower you. You take risks. We'll back you. We'll back you. I'm not blind risk. Something which you will have to discuss with your boss. But you know, a lot of work you will do on your own rather than saying that, please guide me in doing this. Please guide me. Please nurture me. I want people who are self-starters. So, um, I have to ask you one question. You know what you said about giving your mentality to the team. You yourself have an aggressive mentality. You want to win. It's easy to do that with 10, 20, 30 people. How do you do it when there's 1,000 people working with you? How do you ensure it like, penetrates through the whole organization? So I think ultimately, if you do it directly or through indirectly, like you, you can do it through your own team. If they buy into your story, they in turn will do it in their team and it will cascade down. So there is one way of cascading it down, you know, wherein every level will talk about a similar mindset. Is it culture? Like a it culture is culture is very, very important in the organization. Culture is very important and the top drives the culture in any organization. So top two, three layers, if I have three layers, then I have 50, 100 people, then they all they have to do is... Be themselves. Yes. Yeah. And have that thing. I'm not saying be aggressive. I'm saying that create that growth mindset, create that empowerment, uh, some degree of risk-taking, experimentation, innovation. And I think that's what you do. And then you have town hall meetings where you do it once in six months. And now with all the internet and all, you have virtual meetings. So you get an opportunity to interact and tell about stories. At those events, you talk about those individuals who have done innovation, ask them to speak to others. So you go on reinforcing it from different angles. You can write articles, share it with people. So there are multiple ways of doing it directly through your team, through town hall meetings, through writing, uh, through... So, so many options are there, you know, and you have to create the right policies, you know. Uh, if I have, if I go on asking what is the profit rather than asking what is the sales, mm. then I'm giving a signal that profit is more important. Mm. So, I think people have to realize that sales growth is more important and profits is a result of sales increasing. So, this is a burning business question that I've always wanted to ask you, uh, which is that, you know, when we see like the Tata Group, say, where they've sustained for like more than 200 years yes, now. Yes, yes. Forget them. Keep them on the side. Let's look at some of these Japanese companies, which they say have sustained themselves for more than 1,000 years. Yes. So what is your blueprint of how organizations can do that, especially yes. Indian organizations? We, with what we are building, we're trying to uh, keep it in India to the globe. We're trying to sell to the West with level. So uh, our main aim as co-founders is how do we create something that's there two millennia, millennia after us? Yes. You know, 2,000 years after us, how do we create something like that? What is your blueprint of that, sir? Sure, sure. So I think there are different types of entrepreneurs. There are some entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs who say, okay, I'll build a business, I'll sell it off, I'll monetize it, I'll make money, I'll enjoy my life. I am not in that mold. I'm in the mold of perpetuity. So tomorrow, if something happens to me, the business should continue on a perpetual basis. And how does that happen? First of all, you need to have a very strong business. In our case, very strong brands, market leaders in whatever we do. So it's relatively not that, shall I say, disruptive compared to some other businesses which are getting disrupted by technologies. Mm. Like you've seen the likes of Nokia and many others, you know, Blueberry and all that. Yeah. Sorry, Blackberry. Mm. Um, so luckily in our business, the disruptions are there, like D2C brands and you know e-commerce and all that, but not so bad that we can get disrupted. Having said that, even if the disruption is happening, organizations can become can go up through a perpetual route by doing a few things. You know, one is, what is the purpose of the organization? Everybody should know. Number two, what is the strategy of the organization? What, where will you play? And why will you win? So it has to be a very focused strategy. 
and we are very clear that we will be in beauty and wellness and not beyond that. We are very clear that we will be in the emerging markets and not developed markets. We are clear that we have to have a right to win if we launch a new product. We have to have something unique or pioneering and no me too launch of product. Mm. And we are also clear in the strategy where we will not operate. So it's a two-page strategy document which is captured very, very precisely what we will do and why will we win and what we will not do. Now that is shared with the board. The board will play a very, very important role in driving perpetuity of the organization, the board of directors. It's an independent body and board comprised of very good quality of talent, uh, experts in different diverse fields which are relevant for the organization. So in our board, we have an FMCG expert, we have a retail expert, we have a digital expert, we have an HR expert, we have a finance expert, you know. So they will, I mean, all these issues get discussed at the board. And the third thing is, so they will critique the strategy every year in the strategy retreat. And the third thing is culture and values for which we have a defined set of values and we will measure that values amongst all our members every year. And the results of that again will get shared with the board. So the board is aware of purpose, strategy, culture mm. on a perpetual basis. Every year they will, they will get a chance if they need to change the culture or strategy. Then the role of the board is to select the right leadership team because ultimately it's the people who drive perpetuity. So selecting the right leadership team, which comprises of the managing director and his immediate team, CXOs, is the board's responsibility. So the board will select and not only select, the board will make the management team perform better. Mm. Whatever is required, whether it's coaching or if somebody is not able to cope up, then they will decide, okay, I have to change that person leader. But talent has to be top class. So combines purpose, strategy, culture with top quality talent and all that the board has to own. And if that happens, I reckon that uh, the organization will continue yeah, Hopefully for a long, long period of time. I also wanted to ask you, you know, like when we are talking about mindset, you know, let's say a company goes to a thousand crore size yeah. and when they are now then starting to list, what are some of the lessons that they should keep in mind? You're saying what are the lessons of going public? Is yeah. that the question? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's very important that going public and being private is, is very different. It, your life is going to change if you become a public company. I think most important thing you need to ask, why am I going public? There has to be some reason and not just for the sake of going public or being in the news, you know. In my case, I had a reason because I had I had uh, paid my uncles uh, and, uh, you know, take over, taken over their shares. So I had taken debts and I had to retire those debts, you know, and I couldn't have done it through any other route. So that forced me to go public. Hmm. And once you are public, then it's a different ballgame because then you are much more under scrutiny from regulators, from shareholders, from advisories. You get reported much more in the in the press, so you are far more uh, in the press also, so-called. You have quarterly pressures, you have to perform. Uh, then the short tech, short share prices, if they don't do well, people go on asking when will it improve. So, I mean, it's a different ball game. And uh, luckily, we have managed it well. You have to manage the short term as well as long term. You have to create shareholder value. So you have to be sensitive to all these facts. And then you have to have a very strong board of directors. And if you plan it proactively, there is... I have not repented going public at all. In fact, I have been, I'm quite happy that we were, the circumstances forced us to go public. Otherwise, I would never have gone public. And because there are so many people watching you from outside, to that extent, there is higher pressure within the system that, okay, we have to perform. If we don't do it, I mean, what will be the reaction amongst the markets? But you have to do it in the right manner. You can't then cook up the books and you can't do something which will impact you in the next quarter. You know, you can't. You can't create a story if there is no story. You have to have fundamental building blocks to succeed. So, so one thing I've just figured in all businesses is everyone's going to face failure. And the logic always has to be you go back to the failure, analyze it, take your learnings, move forward aggressively. Yes. Uh, is that actually the core of consistency? Because you guys have kind of sustained yourselves at the top for so long. Is, it, is, it, is this a huge part of it? I would say failures and risk taking and experimentation is a huge part of driving that because out of that comes in some successes wherein you become market leaders. So in each and every product we are in, we are market leaders, mm. each and every product. Mm. And I think ultimately you have to select those niches where you can become market leaders. You, I can't launch a Me Too product with uh, against a multinational, a very strong brand and, and aim to become market leader. So I have to occupy certain niches where I can be very strong. Mm. 
mm. and I have to offer something unique, innovative, pioneering, which will make me stand out. Mm. And not only when you launch, but on a perpetual basis. So you have to create a culture which is which is geared towards innovation. What about when you see younger Harsh Mariwalas with younger Maricos coming at you for your market? And you know, because you've built out such a big organization, the outlook from the startup world is, okay, let's build a new FMCG product that will kind of take on the older FMCG brands. Yes. And I'm sure you've seen this repeatedly. Lots of young people must have come with more agile teams, maybe just because of their size. Yeah. Uh, you know, some kind of new fundas with their product. So what should your mentality be as a seasoned veteran? Like, what are your strengths in that fight? See, the biggest disruptor which has happened, and I'm not going to the earlier days, but these days, the last three, four years, is what is known as D2C brands, direct-to-consumer brands. Because of the emergence of uh, e-buying, mm. because of digital marketing, some of the entry barriers which were there among smaller entrepreneurs have vanished. In the past, if you didn't have a good distribution network, if you didn't have big budgets in terms of marketing your product through television channel, you would never have been able to succeed. But all that is gone. Now you need limited budget to launch a product. You just need to be present in Amazon, wherever, uh, whatever other sites, you know, where you can Nike up. And you can launch the product and you can experiment it. So we have seen emergence of new brands catering to new segments. And I think FMCG industry has to has to be aware that these are the new age competitors which are coming in. Mm. And they could also be opportunities for you to acquire these brands. We have acquired two of their brands. We have acquired Beardo, which was again a brand built uh, through e-commerce. And I think last year or this year, we should be able to do 100 crore turnover in their brand. Wow. So there may be acquisition opportunities for FMCG industry. But this is something which uh, you have to learn from uh, these new age entrepreneurs, mm. these D2C brands, because the way they work is very, very different than the way we work. Mm. So what we've done is we've not even combined it with our traditional marketing. It's a separate office. Okay. The speed at which they move, agility, new product launches is something else. Mm. Got it. So, so speaking about the D2C space, of mm. course, we got to make this a little bit about the digital space because that's where Harshil and myself are from also. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you consume a lot of content, you know, you watch your Netflix and all. Do you consume YouTube content as well? Uh, more music. Okay, yeah. okay. How, how do you... And now a little bit more of the Ranveer show. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> How, how do you keep yourself up with, you know, what's happening in the modern? Because I'm sure as a business person, yes. you are trying to stay in touch with, okay, how is the millennials thinking? How is Gen Z thinking? In some format. How so I think you have to look at trends, especially okay. looking at trends which are happening in the international market. It's a matter of time. Those trends will come to India. Mm. So you have to do a lot of reading. You have to do a lot of internet search. You have to visit also two years or three years, three years back before pandemic. <laughs> I visited New York and uh, we invested in a company which invests in these new age businesses. And uh, I picked up lots and lots of trend, whether it's a vegan trend or sustainability trend. I mean, so many trends which, which are happening. It's a matter of time. They'll come and we've seen them coming, all of them. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what are the new trends which are emerging. And ultimately, you have to interact a lot with the millennials yeah. <laughs> because that's where they will drive, you know. And their drive for sustainability, veganism, my son is a vegan, yeah. uh, is amazing. Yes. Because they feel that, okay, in their lives, they will suffer. And for us, it may be, we will just ride through that wave. But all this negative impact of this environment and all that is going to hit us much later. Yeah. So you also, I think one of the questions has come in of, you know, how you see India in 2050. Yeah, so, I, I, I'd like to reframe that question a bit. Maybe... 2050 is one part of the question. Yeah. I'd also want to know 2030 or post-pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so what what about these two points in the timeline, sir, according to you? So I think uh, I always look at the positive of pandemic. Of course, there are huge negatives and all of us have suffered through that and many of us have suffered through some loss of our dear and near ones. But on the positive side, it has accelerated trends. The digital is the biggest trend, I would say. Number two, agility and, and cycle times. You know? Vaccines were developed within one and a half, two years. Normally, they would have taken 10 years. So the whole agility is now getting applied to all the pharma research, all the FMCG, whatever new product development. And then the overall awareness for health. Dramatic increase. We ourselves increased three or four healthy products. And they've had very good traction because people are far more health conscious. Mm -hmm. And not only health in terms of eating, 
but in terms of mental health in terms of physical health exercising yoga meditation and i think these are very good trends which are likely to succeed mm. so all in all i am saying that and then the leadership the leadership realized that we have to be far more empathetic we have to show more empathy because people have suffered mm. and you have to be far more authentic in terms of how we deal with people mm. so i think these are very very important trends which will not go down because we have experienced that not for one month 15 days but for almost one and a half years now mm. and housewives are very easy to buy through <laughs> e channel kids are learning through e route you do doctor consultation <laughs> through e route so even meeting zoom meetings why should i call you to my office for one hour meeting mm. i will say okay let's do a zoom call mm. so would you like to hear a cute kind of tech input that i have been studying uh, recently of course <laughs> have you heard of the metaverse i have read i the name is familiar but i don't uh, okay. not able to recollect yeah so you've heard of steven spielberg right so yes, yes. jurassic park yeah, and yeah, jaws yeah, yeah, yeah. so he directed a movie called ready player 1 okay. which was sort of an essay on the metaverse so i think it's set in like 2050 the movie where people put on like virtual reality goggles yeah. and they enter a new world. Yes. Now that new world is legitimately a new world. Okay. So the human being is sitting in one place in probably a pod, he's put on uh goggles and the human being enters like a whole new world. Mm. Where he gets to look a certain way, where he has his own wardrobe in that world, where he has his own house in that world, mm. where he has his own job in that world. Mm-hmm. So that's what the world of the uh tech startups believes that we are slowly moving towards the metaverse. Okay. where there are a lot of fashion startups now that are uh, kind of being built purely for the metaverse okay. like uh, maybe sneaker companies are now building metaverse based shoes yeah. uh, that's how we also hear about nfts and all that lately mm-hmm. you know these are uh, basically art pieces that you will decorate your home yes, with yes, in the I metaverse yes yes that's what of nft yeah um so my take on that is definitely that's a possibility but the metaverse is going to happen you know uh, and a, a lot of the stuff even we are doing we're kind of building towards that with level but there's also this whole offline world which will be extremely health centric mm. because that world might drive you a little bit crazy it's going to affect your mental health i feel yeah. it's definitely going to affect your physical health because what you'll just be like controlling a bot in that yeah. world right so i feel the offline world is going to be very health centric mm. and the online world is going to be extremely creatively charged yes. so we are going to see ui designers ux designers right. uh, artists kind of flourish in that world creativity is going to come to the forefront mm-hmm. a lot of our offline world by that point maybe might be governed by ai like all the menial jobs will be taken up and maybe these the metaverse will give rise to a lot of new jobs which we can't even fathom right now but in the offline world health is going to come to a forefront like to the forefront again so uh, what do you have to say sir have you are you fascinated i don't think it's either or you know we okay. make the biggest mistake we make is either or you take you online offline mm. we are veering towards omni channel where you need both off and on okay. similarly you talk of digital and physical is coming to uh, digital mm. Physi- mm. <laughs> so even the meet- so everything is moving towards a combination it's not either or you will have combined you will have this plus you will have this also and this is where i'm coming from i'm taking two examples i given about omni channel and digital but i think that's how because i don't think we can make choices we need both again when you're looking back at your life and say there's a page written about you after you're gone what would you like that page to <laughs> it should reflect on what i am you know i don't want anything to be written which is it should be a true and fair account of what i am that's to me is what very you, important what would you like to leave for the world so i would say that what difference have i made to others lives to me that is the most important thing as an individual whether it's my employees or somebody who has come to me for advice and a lot of people come to me especially entrepreneurs have i been able to help them you know i have to in my giving initiatives which is in the area of mental health and entrepreneurs it's just not donating money i go into actually how do i i give my own time what is known as active giving and then finally okay what is the legacy i have built will it sustain over a period of time it's very important you know i can't build an organization and if i'm not there tomorrow it will fall flat then that means i have not built a very strong organization mm. it is highly dependent on me mm. and as an individual i mean one has followed very high standards of governance and also i think governance plays a very very important role uh, and governance is relevant irrespective of the size of the organization many entrepreneurs think that i will look at governance when i grow and now the whole subject of governance has shifted to shifted to what is known as esg you know environmental society and governance so i think that's also very very important at the heart of it i'm a very simple man <laughs> that's so yeah it's, it's actually coming through it was such yeah, a great and very transparent uh, person so i think that's what 
I reckon people would talk. So it's like an honor to have your story put out on our platform more than once, you know. And uh, I, 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 I'm honestly just humbled that you came to our little studio. You know, you spoke this openly. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I got much. to do it with like a brother, co-founder to me. So that's even more special. We're at a very important part of our own journeys. You know, we've been near launch of that product, and it's just even just a conversation with you is a blessing, sir. So. My, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, from the bottom of our hearts, yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank thank you, you so thank much. You. Means a lot. Thank you. thank you. So that was a special episode with Harsh Mariwala. A part of the podcast was consciously cut out from the episode because a part of this conversation was about Harsh sir actually mentoring Harshal and me for level. Whenever you're trying to go into a battle, whenever you're trying to go into a war. you should speak to the generals and the colonels who've been in those kind of battles those kind of wars before you that's what this episode was for harshal and myself it was a dream come true for both of us for me to have harsh sir visit my office for harshal to have this kind of a deep conversation with his idol and i hope you guys felt that inspiration that we felt through the course of this podcast harsh sir will definitely return on the ranvi show this is special for me do share it amongst your entrepreneurial circles i know that if you've watched it or listened to it till this point you're probably an entrepreneur yourself or you have entrepreneurial ambitions in life this was a master class in business and entrepreneurship thank you for listening remember to follow the ranvi show on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world we grow through your support keep supporting us thank you guys